doing? Good. Good to see you again. Uh, as you may remember, I'm Ann Minnett, the Director of Academic Programs, and I'm also a member of the committee that selected Americana. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the class of 2018 Matt Reed's Convocation. Before I introduce our presenters, I want to remind you of the reasons we chose the book and invited you to read it over the summer. A central feature of a liberal arts education is developing the capacity to think critically, carefully, and compassionately about complex world issues. The challenges posed by global migration, identity, and racism are among the most important we currently face. We thought Americana addressed these concerns gracefully and with intelligence. We also thought Adichie told a compelling story, and we hope you enjoyed reading her novel as much as we did. It is now my pleasure to introduce two individuals whose scholarship and teaching touch on many of these themes. Bill Mosley is Chair of the Geography Department and Director of African Studies. He is a human environment and development geographer with research interests in political ecology, tropical agriculture, food security, environment and development policy, land reform, fair trade, and Africa. Before joining McAllister in 2002, Dr. Mosley spent 10 years in the field of international development as a project manager and policy analyst for organizations such as Save the Children, the World Bank, USAID, and the Peace Corps. Kendrick Brown is a social psychologist who focuses on how individuals negotiate systematic biases, in particular racism, to establish or maintain connections within and between social status groups. He has conducted research on the effects of skin tone bias on African American psychological well-being, how white American student athletes' racial attitudes are shaped by their interactions with teammates of color, and dominant groups' attitudes towards policies intended to address racial inequalities in the United States and European Union nations. Dr. Brown joined McAllister in 1998, immediately after earning his PhD. I might add, one of the youngest faculty hires to date, Go Kendrick, <laughs> and is currently beginning his sixth year as Associate Dean of the Faculty. Please join me in welcoming Professors Mosley and Brown. So good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here, and thank you to Ann Minnick for that kind introduction. I'm truly honored to be co-delivering uh, the class of 2018's first lecture. Uh, I'm teaching a first-year seminar this fall, The Geography of Africa, and therefore have already met a subset of your peers, not to mention their parents. Well, I can't say this for the parental units. Everyone in the class showed up on time, eager, and ready to learn. So we're off to a good start on our joint adventure over the next four years. So let us begin. I was talking to my partner a few months ago, who also happens to have read the book Americana, and she said, why are they having you give this lecture? At the time, she was looking at me clearly in interrogation mode, in our domestic space where I'm just a dude, where my PhD means absolutely nothing. <laughs> I responded that I'm a geographer who works in West Africa. I suppose they want me to give some international perspective, to provide some context on Nigeria and the experience of Africans who immigrate to the US. She scoffed. But the book is about race relations in the U.S. Furthermore, she said, eyebrows raised. I think a feminist scholar would have a field day with this text. The main character, Femalu, only seems to find fulfillment through her relationships with men. Why aren't her relationships with female friends more developed? What the hell is all that about, geography man? <laughs> Indeed, this novel has a lot to say about race relations in the U.S., and I will not be talking about that. Professor Brown clearly is more qualified than I to provide you with commentary 
I will also not be deconstructing the novel from a critical feminist perspective. What I will do, as hinted at earlier, is give you a little background and context regarding Nigeria. I then want to focus on three themes that this novel prompted me to consider. First, international journeys, the process of going away and coming back home. Second, privilege and hybridity. And third, praxis or thoughtful action. So first, let me share a little bit of background on Nigeria. Nigeria is by uh, far and away the largest country in Africa in terms of population. It has 178 million people. It's over twice as large as the next two largest countries, Ethiopia and Egypt. Nigeria is a middle-income country. Its economy is the largest in Africa and ranks 26th in the world in terms of gross domestic product. Nigeria is also a former British colony, winning independence in 1960. Oil was discovered in Nigeria in 1956 and production began in 1958. Nigeria's crude oil is of particularly high quality, meaning that it has low sulfur content. The U.S. has been engaged in Nigeria's petroleum industry and is its top customer, purchasing roughly 40% of its oil exports. While the country has over 300 different ethnic groups, there are three main groups, which are the majority in different regions of the country. The Hausa and Fulani in the northern part of the country, who are predominantly Muslim. The Yoruba in the southwest, where Lagos is located, who are predominantly Christian. And the Igbo in the southeast, who are also predominantly Christian. As you know, both Ephemelu and Obinze, the main characters in the novel, are supposed to be Igbo, as is the author, Chimanda Ngozi Adichie. One of the most significant events in post-colonial Nigeria was the ba Biafran War, where the Igbo in the southeast part of the country tried to secede to create the independent state of Biafra. This civil war lasted from roughly 1967 to 1970 and was especially bloody, with roughly 100 million people dying from the fighting and related famine. The war was in part about ethnic tensions between these different groups, but also about control of the oil fields on Igbo lands. Today, ethnic and religious tensions still persist between the largely Muslim North and the Christian South in Nigeria. There's a long, simmering environmental justice crisis in the oil-producing regions of the country, where local people have protested against uh, oil environmental degradation, a struggle made famous by the now deceased Nigeria used to have one of the more dynamic manufacturing sectors in West Africa. It was also formerly largely self-sufficient in food production. However, as the oil industry grew more prominent, both manufacturing and agriculture atrophied. Oil accounts today for 98% of Nigeria's exports. Nigeria also has a long history of coup d'etats and involvement of the military in politics, a fact that some social scientists link to the oil industry. The 70s, 80s, and 90s were filled with coups and a series of military juntas, but the country now has had a democratically elected government since 1999. I believe this context on Nigeria is useful because it helps us understand that the fictional story which Chimanda Ngozi Adichie is sharing with us reflects a great deal of the realities of contemporary Nigeria, as well as its colonial and post-colonial history. These realities include ethnic tensions in the country, the uncertainty created by military coups, the aspirations of middle-class families, and the appeal of the United States as a destination for study, business, or employment. There are also the challenges of religious fundamentalism in Nigeria, the complications faced by young men in obtaining visas to go to other countries, and the differential power between men and women in Nigerian society. I also think it is interesting to consider which of Nigeria's realities Adichie does not highlight in her novel. There is, for example, almost no mention of the oil industry 
how this is a source of much of Nigeria's money, the country's close relationship with the United States in the post-colonial period, and arguably much of the political instability in the country. So I now would like to move on to my three major themes of international journeys, privilege and hybridity, and praxis, or thoughtful action. So first, international journeys. Americana is, in large part, a book about the journey of going to another country, spending time there, and then coming back home. Part of this journey is the vividness of the impressions you have when you arrive in a new place. How one is hyper aware of the differences from their home country when they arrive in this new place, as you all might be as you've arrived on this campus. On the flip side, once one is acculturated to this other place and then comes back home, one is extra aware of what is peculiar or different about your own home. The result in this case is a double critique, a critique of U.S. society and a critique of Nigerian society. But more broadly, let us consider more carefully the insights such journeys might produce, how they change us, and the hybrid persons they produce. So, I want to ask a couple of questions of you all. And you're going to need to answer these by standing up or staying seated. So, how many of you have traveled to another country and stayed for any length of time? A country other than your own? Please stand. Okay. Now, of these folks, if you have stayed in that other country for at least two months, I want you to stay standing. If you have not, I'd like you to sit down. And then finally, how many of you have stayed in that country for at least a year? If you have so, stay standing. If you not, please sit down. Okay. Thank you all for your participation. That was to wake you up mainly, but I think it is also interesting to see how well traveled we are, certainly on the shorter end. Uh, and then who has stayed in other countries for more extensive periods of time. And so those folks who did remain standing past my first question should have been able to relate in many ways to the, the themes in this book. And if I ask this question again four years from now at graduation time, I suspect that many more of you will remain standing through these different questions. But the real import of this query, however, is not whether you have traveled, but what you gain from that experience, and how you will use those insights. In the book, The Innocents Abroad, 19th century American author Mark Twain wrote, quote, travel is fatal to prejudice, bigotry, and narrow-mindedness, and many of our people need it sorely on these accounts, unquote. Twain's quote, famous quote highlights the potential virtues of travel, but I want to be clear that this is an ideal scenario, and furthermore, that travel is a privilege not accessible to everyone. Travel does not always make for a better person, as Twain has articulated. A potential problem with shorter-term travel is that you may have a superficial experience with the culture, which only serves to reinforce stereotypical impressions. The classic example of this might be a package tour with well-rehearsed cultural experiences that cater to outside expectations rather than the internal realities of a place. If you stay longer in a place, say a few months or an entire semester, you may begin to push through this veneer of initial impressions and expectations to begin to grapple with the reality of the place. I've led study abroad programs for McAllister three times now, and there is a predictable pattern of adjustment. It begins with initial euphoria, because everything is new, cool, and interesting. Followed about a month into the experience by depression and frustration with the realities, challenges, and differences of a new place. This is coupled with the realization that you actually have to deal with these challenges because you are not leaving tomorrow. Then, if students are lucky, they emerge from this funk with a more grounded and nuanced understanding of this new place, only to go back home 
a new set of expectations and experience this process all over again. Adichie, through the voice of Ephem, spends a lot of time commenting on race dynamics in the U.S. But we also hear about other issues, such as her own initial expectations for America that are smashed even in the early period of her time here about the challenges of adjusting to a new educational culture and her commentary on certain American practices. For starter, her initial beliefs that it is always cold in America and that there is no poverty are practically upended on day one. Her challenges in the American classroom should have resonated or at least have been of interest to many of the international students in this audience. She learns, for example, to speak in a certain way in the American classroom and to adjust to a new educational culture. At home in the Nigerian classroom, memorization was most important. And now she finds herself in a setting where classroom participation is highly valued. Most interesting to me were her comments on some practices in the U.S. Practices that we have normalized yet under a slightly different guise, also categorized as wrong or backward in other cultural contexts. I love, for example, her commentary on tipping culture in the U.S. What is the difference between tipping and bribing? At the end of the day, the difference may not be one of substance, but whether or not a practice is socially sanctioned. Americans give money to underpaid waitstaff as a reward for good service. There's an unspoken deal. We'll pay you a little more if you take good care of us. But then Americans often wag their fingers at African governments where corruption and bribing are seen as rampant. Where someone might pay a little extra to an underpaid civil servant to get something done, to get better service. While I'm not defending this practice, the difference between this and paying a little extra for good service at a restaurant seems nominal. Ifem also returns to Nigeria as a different person than what the one she left. <laughs> Superficially, she may exhibit certain American affectations, what she calls being an American. But she also is a different person and therefore sees and views her home differently. Having dwelt in more than one place, she is now a hybrid of sorts. She sees what is good, but she also sees what is bad. She likes being home, feeling at ease in a place where no one questions her identity, but she also wonders about the material and consumer culture of Nigeria's growing middle class, the conspicuous consumption, the emptiness of the drive to accumulate more goods. My own experience in this regard was when I served as a Peace Corps volunteer for two and a half years in Mali, West Africa in the 1980s. I would subsequently work for longer periods of time abroad, but what was unique about this time in the Peace Corps was that it was in the pre-internet, pre-cell phone era. And furthermore, I did not have the resources to come home during the entire period. So there I was serving in a village of 200 people as an agricultural agent, and the only connection I had to my home was letters and twice yearly phone calls. This time in Mali was a transformational experience for me. I, like Ephem, was hyper aware of all the differences when I arrived in my new home. The new smells, sounds, and cultural practices. I, like Ephem, also had a lot of my stereotypes and assumptions challenged upon arriving in Mali. I remember being terrified that my presence in this small village of 200 people would somehow disrupt their local culture. That I might inadvertently create new desires and wants which would destroy their what I thought was a pristine way of life. I distinctly recall hanging out with my Malian friends one evening drinking tea, as we almost always did, and I wanted to trim my toenails. Of course, I had a toenail clipper, but I thought if I publicly used this, I would inflame a desire for this new, important object. 
So I set about to trim my toenails with a large hunting knife, <laughs> coming perilously close to removing a few digits. Fortunately, my Malian friends, looking upon a horror, stopped me. One held up a pair of toenail clippers, <laughs> saying, here, this is what we use to trim our nails. <laughs> Clearly, my belief that this was a primitive, isolated culture was misguided. This place had long been connected to the rest of the world, and I needed to recognize that. I was not the imperial agent, the potential destroyer of local culture I thought I was. I subsequently fell in love with Mali, and especially their agricultural and natural resource management practices, and explains much of the way I am today a geographer who studies food and agriculture in Africa. But this experience also forever changed the way I looked at the U.S. I came home a different person who could never look at his own culture in the same way. I had become hybridized. So now let us talk about privilege and hybridity. In an interview with NPR last year, Chimandi Ngozi Adichie said that she recognized that she was extremely privileged to have studied in the U.S. and to now effectively live in two places, Baltimore, Maryland for part of the year, and Lagos, Nigeria for the other part. Clearly, international journeys are a privilege, and the vast majority of the global population never has had the possibility to have such an experience. Or, perhaps the international journey was not one of choice. People have been forced to leave home because of strife, political persecution, environmental disasters, or economic destitution. This sets up a different dynamic than the middle-class student coming to the U.S. for an education, or the middle-class American studying or working abroad. But what about those folks who could afford to travel in terms of time and money, but choose never to engage in a cross-cultural experience? I don't know the answer to that question. It would be interesting to discuss when you meet after this talk. But I'll throw this out there. What if cross-cultural journeys were an obligation? Some of you may be familiar with the practice of the Hajj in Islam. It's one of the faith's five pillars or tenets. It suggests that all of the faithful should make a pilgrimage to the holy city of Mecca during their lifetimes, if possible, if they have the means. What if cross-cultural journeys were like the Hajj? That is, everyone who had the means to do so was obligated to engage in a cross-cultural journey during their lifetime, based on a belief that this would somehow make you a better person, and that society overall would benefit from such experiences. That dwelling in two different places, hybridity breeds insight. Now the reality is, we don't have an obligation to engage in a cross-cultural uh, journey in our society, but we do encourage it in places like McAllister, for some of the same reasons I just mentioned. This is often in the form of study away, or a postgraduate experience. But with this privilege of being able to engage in a cross-cultural journey comes the responsibility of sharing new understanding and perhaps the responsibility to act on that new understanding. So that brings me to my last theme for today, which is praxis. With newfound understanding often comes the desire or need to act, to do something to make the world a better place. The desire to do something is not unusual and in fact quite common amongst many McAllister students. My hope, however, is that McAllister College produces students who want to more than simply act on an impulse or insight to make the world a better place, but who go about this in a thoughtful and theoretically informed manner, something known as praxis. Over the years, I've encountered students who have an allergic reaction to theory. They eschew theory because they believe it to be irrelevant, impractical, esoteric. They just want to do stuff. Well, the reality is that, is that nobody just does stuff. We are all consciously or unconsciously acting on some mental model of how the world functions. 
Theory is exactly that, a simplified model for the way the world works. We can't survive without these models as we need them to process and organize information. That said, the sooner we become aware of our own mental models, the sooner we recognize the connections between the world of ideas and the realm of action, the sooner we can interrogate our own models and iteratively improve upon them over time. This will then lead to more thoughtful action or praxis. Adichie does a good job of peeling back the facade of contemporary American and Nigerian society to show us the problems underneath. What she does not provide us with, in my view, is an explanation for the problems she brings to light. If anything, we are left to conclude that racism in America or conspicuous consumption and corruption in Nigeria are a product of local culture. Full stop. Now, in all fairness, perhaps explanation is not the job of a novelist. But as a social scientist, trying to explain the process behind what we observe is critical. And furthermore, these explanations often involve theory and models of how the world functions. Take the case of corruption in Nigeria. It is tempting to see this as a purely local problem, one that is attributable to local ethics, cultural attitudes, or behaviors. But one could have an explanation that was more structural in nature, one that is informed by ideas like Andre Gunder Frank's dependency theory. Frank basically argues that countries like Nigeria were underdeveloped during the colonial period. While Nigeria was once largely self-sufficient with an economy that catered to its own needs, colonial policies such as the head tax pushed Nigerians to produce less food for their own households and commodity crops for export to Europe so they could earn money to pay those head taxes. This led to famines in the colonial era which ironically were blamed on Nigerians' own ag practices and overpopulation with no recognition at all that it was the colonial policies that might have had a lot to do with it. In a similar vein, Britain and the U.S. have been deeply involved in the Nigerian petroleum industry, warping the economy and developing what some would call a petrostate. In other words, our consumption habits are deeply connected to contemporary political, environmental, and social problems in Nigeria. This is a very different explanation or theory than one that frames these problems as primarily local. The implications for action are huge in this instance. Mindless activism means going over to Nigeria and trying to address local norms and behaviors. In their view, we as Americans are disconnected from the problems. We are external actors coming in as saviors. In contrast, dependency theory pushes us to think about how we might be connected to the problem. What is the genesis of our rapacious thirst for oil, our addiction which drives us to intervene around the world and often support unsavory dictators? In the U.S. in the mid-20th century, a constellation of interests emerged to engineer a petroleum-based form of development. We built spatially diffused suburbs fueled by federally backed housing sub loans for largely white middle class families. The government invested massively in specific forms of transportation infrastructure, namely the federal highway system, which fueled auto based interurban traffic uh, uh, travel, and because of ring rounds around, around cities, an increasingly diffuse city form. The government and petroleum-related interests then largely dismantled public transport in all of the largest American cities through buyouts and unfavorable subsidies. Why? I'm not an expert on social pathologies, but I think racism and concentrated corporate power has a lot to explain. Uh, it does a long way in explaining what happened. Racism, because it, it's a repelling force that works against people living together, and therefore fosters this kind of diffuse, urban, energy-intensive living. So this is where I want to end. 
that the problem of racism in the U.S. and the challenges in contemporary Nigeria may not be entirely disconnected from one another. Cross-cultural journeys not only help us to better understand problems in our own countries and others, but to explore potential connections between these issues. These journeys are a gift, a privilege that often changes us forever. We become hybrids in the best sense of the word. This hybridity breeds new insights which we not only have the responsibility to act upon, but to act in a nuanced and informed manner. And because of this, I have hope. Thank you. So I think that insight is very helpful for us to have in this novel. 
Uh, another thing that I want to bring up and touch on from what Bill talked about was this idea of adjustment, or I use a psychological term, acculturation. Uh, really struggling with the unspoken and yet real rules that govern the way in which interactions happen in a space. I think by delving into the characters in the novel, we really get a sense of what happens when you look at things from this new perspective and you have to negotiate these very complex social rules that are not the same as what you're accustomed to and that brings some insights as well. And then lastly, um, I want to actually talk about something I think that's going to lead into the talk, which is insularity. What happens when people really can't see beyond what happens in their culture? What if you can't question particular things in your culture? You take it for granted. Not only do you take it for granted, you expect other people who may not be from that culture to also take it for granted and to know the rules of it. And I think that comes through in the novel too in a number of different places, and I'll talk about that in a bit. But I think all of those points, many of which Bill talked about, are important for us to keep in mind. Um, I'm going to use a metaphor for my talk, and you can see that in the title there. Um, acknowledging the elephant in the room. So think about what the elephant in the room is, and I like this cartoon because I think it does a really good job of illustrating what happens when you have the elephant in the room. Uh, you can't read it back there, but it says in the caption, only Alan was prepared to acknowledge the elephant in the room because the elephant is sitting on Alan. <laughs> so if you think about this, I, I like this metaphor because in many respects, there are a lot of people in the United States who are having an elephant sit on them right now, and other people are starting to look around and everything but that elephant that's sitting on them. And I think that's an important, an important metaphor, and I think it's something that's especially true when you consider, consider what's been happening in the United States since especially the civil rights movements of the 1950s and 60s. So let me talk, let me give you an idea of what I want to talk about. I'm going to touch on some major themes, three major themes that I want to go over with you. The first is, I want to talk about obstacles that impede understanding how race works in the United States. That's a major theme. In the book, I'm going to make it more uh, apparent, more transparent as we talk about it. Uh, I want to talk about some points that are necessary for unveiling U.S. racial hierarchy. There is indeed a hierarchy in the United States, uh, and I think the book does a wonderful job of unveiling a lot of it. And then I want to talk about what we can do in moving forward with this knowledge, this wonderful gift that Adichie has given us in her novel and the points that it reads. So let's start with talking about the obstacles that impede understanding how race works in the United States. There are many things that are constructed both within the social structure and within the culture of the United States that prevent many of us, those from outside the country as well as those inside the country, uh, of having a good sense of how race works in the U.S. I'm going to use quotations from the book to illustrate these obstacles. Uh, and you don't have to read the book. I actually have them up here, and I'll try to read them in case you're behind a pillar or something, so I'll make sure you understand. But I want to talk about the first obstacle. The first one is many people in the U.S. In the US do not want to see race. Some of you are not going to be surprised by this. This is not a particularly profound point, but I think it's an important point for us to keep in mind because many of us take for granted that we're going to have these conversations, especially coming to McAllister. This is a place where we're going to confront these particular kinds of issues, but you have to keep this point in mind, and it is a major obstacle. Many people do not want to see race. In Chapter 12, um, I think Adichie does a good job with the novel. Uh, there's a nice scene here as they walk out of the store. Thimbaloo said, I was waiting for her, and she's talking about a cashier, to ask, was it the one with two eyes or the one with two legs? Why didn't she just ask, was it the black girl or the white girl? Kanika laughed, because this is America, and you're supposed to pretend that you do not notice certain things. There's a strong pressure in the U.S. Some of you may have been in a particular situation where you felt this, where you're not supposed to notice things. You're not supposed to mention uh, someone's racial background. You're supposed to just use every description in the world that you can to describe someone except that one which can communicate something. So I want to keep us, have us in mind, keep in mind, that this is an obstacle for really seeing and understanding how race works. If you can't even notice it, I'm hard to talk about it. A second obstacle we want to keep in mind 
Many people want to look beyond race and find a non-racial reason for something that has happened. Okay, there's a, a really good um, scene in the book, chapter 37, page 416, and I can give you more examples. I'm just pulling out some to illustrate the point. Um, this is um, Sean, actually. Uh, this is one of um, Ephemelu's boyfriend's uh, sister. Wow, that's a lot of different things there. Um, but here's the quote, and then I, she's talk, and Sean is the one who's talking, then I write about my mom being bitter at work because she felt she'd hit a ceiling, and they wouldn't let her get further because she was black, and my editor says, can we have more nuance? Did your mom have a bad rapport with someone at work, maybe, or had she already been diagnosed with cancer? He thinks we should complicate it so it's not race alone. And I say, but it was race. She was bitter because she thought if everything was the same except the race, she would have been vice president. And she talked about it a lot until she died, but somehow my mom's experience is suddenly unnuanced. Nuance means keeping people comfortable so everyone is free to think of themselves as individuals and everyone gets where they are because of their achievement. This is very important for us to keep in mind because this is a very common thing that happens. Rather than talking about race, folks want to keep it focused on the individual. They want to keep it focused on all those kind of aspirations that individuals do. And that's an obstacle. That's an obstacle to really having a shared understanding of how race works in the United States. If one person wants to see it, another person wants to divert to something else, it's kind of hard to have a conversation. It's kind of hard to really delve into things. A third obstacle. Many people in the U.S. do not want to delve into contradictions and complexity surrounding race. In other words, they want to keep it simple. There's an interesting um, blog piece, and I love the fact that there are blog entries in the novel because it gives Ephemeru a chance to really just go and express things in a very, very clear way. And this is one of her blog posts that we see later on in the novel. And there are a number of points she makes, but this one I think is really relevant. And what she says in this blog post is, of all the tribalisms, Americans are most uncomfortable with race. If you're having a conversation with an American and you want to discuss something racial that you find interesting, and an American says, oh, it's simplistic to say it's race. Racism is so complex. It means they just want you to shut up already. Because of course racism is complex. Many abolitionists wanted to free the slaves but didn't want black people living nearby. Lots of folks today don't mind a black nanny or a black limo driver, but they sure as hell mind a black boss. What is simplistic is saying it's so complex. But shut up anyway, especially if you need a job slash favor from the American in question. I think this is a very interesting comment as well about the ways in which we can have obstacles to understanding about race. Um, if folks want to keep it simple, if they want to just be able to say it's complex and the conversation goes no further, it's kind of, high, kind of hard to go further then. And I think that's an important point that gets brought up in the book in actually a couple of different places, but I think this is a really good illustration of that. And then finally, I'll give you a fourth obstacle um, that's an issue. Often people tailor what they say about race in the U.S. to fit the people to whom they are talking. Now, I think to some extent, of course, you have to tailor what you say to audiences, but when you tailor things so much that communication doesn't effectively happen, that understanding can't develop, then you have an obstacle. And I think this is a good illustration of this. The film loop, uh, at one point started doing some uh, speaking engagements with different groups, and she talks about what, what happened as she's going through talk as dealing with this experience. Uh, chapter 33, and so in the following weeks, as she gave more talks at companies and schools, she began to say what they wanted to hear, none of which she would ever write on her blog because she knew that the people who read her blog were not the same people who attended her diversity workshops. During her talks, she said, by the way, I like this, uh, America has made great progress for which we should be very proud. And then she says, in her blog, she wrote, Racism should never happen until you don't get a cookie for reducing it. <laughs> so I think this is a very important thing if we're changing up our conversation. And in some respects, there are changes that do happen 
for a variety of circumstances, but when we change the conversation, we change the way we talk to people to such an extent that we change what could be said, I think that can represent an obstacle as well. So let me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip over something. I was going to go over that, but I'll skip over it. Let me give you a summary of the first point that I'm making. There are some psychological obstacles that impede understanding how race works in the United States. Color blindness, and Adichie, by the way, if you haven't seen her talk on uh, YouTube or uh, Ed Talks and other things, she hates color blindness, by the way, with a passion. And what the reason why she doesn't like it is because, from her point of view, color blindness can block the perception of race. And that's the first point that I was making. The second point, disputes about attribution. Attribution is how we psychologically decide the cause of something, how we, call, how we understand the cause of behavior. But when we have disputes about attribution, no, that happened because of race, and then the other person said, no, that happened because of something about the individual, we have a hard time having conversations. Third thing, there's an unwillingness to engage cognitive complexity of racial behaviors and events. Uh, we're amazing creatures as human beings. We can process an incredible amount of information, but most of the time we don't. Most of the time we want things to be pretty simple and straightforward because who wants to be overwhelmed by all the things that are happening in the room at that particular time, so let's focus in on this. Race is not something that's easily compartmentalized. And so if we only want to look at this very small piece of it, we miss a lot of complexity. And so trying to make things into something simple and manageable can represent an obstacle. Then lastly, there can be different frames of reference for interpreting racial <coughs> behaviors and events. So if you have some folks who are focused on one way of looking at things and folks focused on another, it's kind of hard to have a good conversation and reach an understanding. Okay? So that's the first part. These are all things can, that can prevent us from having, reaching an understanding about how race could work in the United States. I think the novel does a good job of bringing this to the fore. I want to make a couple of points about what is necessary to unveil U.S racial hierarchy. So we have all these obstacles. Let's say we get past the obstacles. What are the points that we need to keep in mind according to the novel about what happens when we unveil this racial hierarchy? What do we need to keep in mind? A couple of points. The first point, the U.S. has a social structure that impacts people depending on their race. Yes, race matters. And social structure is set up such that it handles that difference that race makes. And so that's important for us to keep in mind. If you look at chapter 17, uh, Afimilu uh, talks about what it is. What, is, what does she mean by this racial hierarchy? What is this hierarchy? And she says, there's a ladder of racial hierarchy in America. White is always on top, specifically white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, otherwise known as WASP. And American black is always on bottom. And what's in the middle depends on time and place. Or, as that marvelous rhyme goes, if you're white, you're all right. If you're brown, stick around. If you're black, go get back. Americans assume that everyone will get the tribalism, but it takes a while to figure it out. Don't get me wrong, there are many different circumstances if you look at different kinds of outcomes in which African Americans are not on the bottom, but as you look across the different range of experiences, this seems to be, according to what Afimilu is saying, seems to be the case. And so racial hierarchy is something we need to keep in mind. Another point, and some of these are going to get really long. Um, this is a really good point, and I encourage you to take a look at chapter 31. This is basically Ephemilu talking to her boyfriend at the time, Kurt, about Essence Magazine and why Essence Magazine is such an important thing. The point that I want to raise to your attention here, or raise for you here, is that U.S. social structure determine, determines who receives attention, who receives uh, the attention of the media, the attention of uh, those of us who are consuming particular, or looking for particular products. And I think this quote does a really good job. And in this quote, Ephemeral is basically saying, of all the different magazines you can look at, notice how there are so few black women who are depicted, and now if you think about that and all the beauty tips and all the rest, whether you subscribe to beauty tips or not, then if you think about all that, you think about hair, there it is again, you think about that, then 
you don't have folks who have a need being met, so you have to have specialized magazines that address the circumstances and the situation of those people. So attention is very important. Uh, lastly, I want to talk about uh, U.S. social structure constructs stereotypes. So we have stereotypes, of course, stereotypes of those images that we have in the mind, of the ways in which people behave, who they're supposed to be, what they're supposed to like, on and on and on. And in this particular quote, um, Afimalu is writing in her blog post about, uh, she called this person white girlfriend, and she said they are Michelle Obama movies. And she talks about the fact that Ephemalu is just speculating about what does it take for Michelle Obama to keep her hair that way. And the friend says, what do you mean, her hair doesn't grow like that? And so she talks about race being, this hair being a good metaphor for race. And also the fact that uh, there are before and after pictures. And so of women, of black women in particular, the before pictures don't always look the most attractive, and the after pictures are supposed to be gorgeous and conform to norms about straight hair and whatnot. And she talks about the fact that these are stereotypes. There are other kinds of stereotypes as well, but social structure can determine that those images that we have in mind when we think about particular people. And then, last point, this is a really long one, but um, I would point out in chapter 16 of Fimlu, was uh, working as a nanny, basically, for a white family. And so one day she had to call for a service, and she's met at the door by a uh, cleaning person, a white man who's a cleaning person, and he's taken aback when he sees her, and then becomes almost instantly uh, belligerent. And a family, from her point of view, thinks he would be perfectly fine if I say, go away right now. But then she says it's not her house, and that she's simply uh, here for the person who lives here, and all of a sudden his demeanor completely changes because now things are the way they should be. So we think about norms and expectations. We think about what it is that people are looking for. That also gets shaped by social structure. And that's an important point as well. So a quick summary of that part. Hierarchical status greatly determines racial experiences. Where we are in a hierarchy can really determine that, of course, and that comes through in the book, I think, very clearly. Image salience is primarily shaped by media institute instruments that reflect a hierarchical status. And what I mean by that is how prominent are the images that we see in the media? How prominent are the images that we see in magazines and on television, on the internet? What are those images? that's shaped by hierarchy as well. And then we have stereotypes that frequently underlie what we consider to be valuable, what we log, what we think is uh, held up, if you will. And then lastly, the norms and expectations that govern interracial inter interactions, they're strong and they're shaped by social structure. Okay, so I've talked about obstacles. I've talked about the different aspects of social structure as they come through in the novel. I want to leave you with one more thing. Moving forward, where do you go with this knowledge? We can talk about praxis, as Bill did earlier, which is you can think about theory, you can think about how that meets your experiences, you can think about what you do with it as you go forward. So I'm going to leave you with this, which is also one last quote from the book. All right, I'm going to pass it too fast. Listen and engage. Um, I think the novel does a good job of telling a story that's very uh, complex that's set in multiple places. But there's one point in the novel I really want to highlight it where Ephemalu is writing a blog post in chapter 36. This, I think, is important. So after this listing of don'ts, what's the do? I'm not sure. Try listening, maybe. Hear what is being said. And remember that it's not about you. American blacks are not telling you that you are to blame. They're just telling you what is. If you don't understand, ask questions. If you're uncomfortable about asking questions, say you're uncomfortable about asking questions, then ask anyway. It's easy to tell when a question is coming from a good place, then listen some more. Sometimes people just want to feel heard. Here's to the possibilities of friendship and connection and understanding. And I think that's an important thing for us to keep in mind as we move forward. And one last point that I'll leave with you is um, one of the lines of research that I do
is I have looked into how people of color think about people they consider the allies, so those people that they feel comfortable with, those people who they can rely on if they ever experience a racial problem or misunderstanding. And they talk about a variety of characteristics that these people have. One of the major characteristics that comes through is that there's a feeling of connection, there's a feeling of respect, and there's a feeling of non-judgmental connection. If you can't make that connection, if you can't engage, even when it gets rough, even when there's a racial misunderstanding, then it becomes very difficult to really move past a lot of contentious issues. And I think that's what this quote is saying. And I think there are a lot of messages in this wonderful book. I, I wish I could share even more with you because I, this is one of the most profound books that I've read in a very long time. And I really hope you all have a chance to delve into it very deeply. Questions, or do we need to, in terms of the time frame? I'm looking at my my morning. Do we have a few minutes for questions? Okay. So there's a mic over here, and then there's a mic over here. And if you have a question, we are happy to um, have you ask it. Uh, how would you describe the status of Native Americans in America's racial hierarchy? From all the outcomes, if you take a look at a lot of the outcomes in U.S. Census, uh, a lot of health disparity issues, mental health, physical health, um, Native Americans have very, in general, and you have to be very careful because I'm speaking in very in broad generalities. You can talk about a number of different tribal groups around the country and they have different circumstances. But in general, uh, it's very bad. It's very bad. Um, you can talk in terms of um, alcohol dependency. You can talk in terms of a lot of other things. And when I say this, I don't want you walking away saying, Professor Brown said that Native Americans are this or that because there's a high amount of resiliency and there's a high amount of strength within communities that does a good job of, of, of sustaining people as they deal with a lot of the pressures that come from both outside and within their community. But in terms of the outcomes, it's, if you look at the U.S. Census, there, there are some pretty, uh, very challenging circumstances. Now, I'm not going to get into uh, you know, it's funny, there's, I use air quotes for this, there's this idea of an oppression Olympics, if you will. Um, I'm not going to get into Native Americans have it the worst. It just really depends on which outcomes you look at, but if you look at particular outcomes, it's, it's a pretty rough situation for, for a lot of folks. Despite that, you want to also ensure that people have fair and equitable outcomes. 
And so, I guess what the recommendation I would have for you all is, um, as you think about the differences that exist between us on this campus, as students, as faculty, staff, what have you, um, acknowledge those differences, but at the same time, uh, don't make them so big that you can't have a conversation. And at the same time, uh, be prepared to make some mistakes and be called on it, and to um, engage. So I think that's important. I thought that was brought up in the book a lot and it was more of an underlying topic was the issue of mental health. And I was wondering if you think that um, outside of the United States and also in colored communities inside the United States, that mental illness truly really has a lower uh, rate of like um, in people or if it's just more heavily stigmatized in their Briefly answer that question. Most of the West African countries I've been in, um, you do encounter people who have mental health challenges. The, the difference is that they're typically not ostracized. They're particularly in rural communities, they're just a part of the community. They're, they're recognized that they're different. Um, I wouldn't say that they're necessarily being treated, but they're a member of that community. And that is different, I think, than the history of, kind of institutionalization in the United States where we tend to we well, it's better now than it used to be, but historically we would say on the side that issue. Maybe we have time for just Let me one. Just add really oh. quickly to that one, that there is of course stigma that can exist within particular communities about mental health. And that that represents a really a real challenge when it comes to for folks to get treatment for. Um, and I think that that can suppress the help seeking behavior. Um, I was actually just this past summer um, at the program for research on Black Americans at the University of Michigan, and that program is all about studying help seeking behaviors. Um, that African Americans have in particular, and also Caribbean folks too. And uh, there's a lot of literature about, about the challenges, both within the system and within the community for folks that have mental health care needs in it. So I just want to add that. So maybe one more question before we send you to your discussion groups. So, it seems like in the book, um, uh, the relationship between the two main characters um, is, you know, a, you know, a you know, first love kind of relationship. And then when they move apart, they begin to have romantic relationships based on more economic terms, like they're trying to get something from the other person. Sometimes it's like when a family goes to America and then she's propositioned, pretty much, she needs to survive, and Obinze has to marry someone in Britain, or he feels like he has to marry someone in Nigeria for an economic reason. Um, I was just wondering which of you would speak to the difference, you know, in the book between having a relationship for like an economic reason and how that differs between West Africa and America. I get crack at this. I, I didn't get into it, but I did allude to um, the issue of power differences between men and women in many West African countries, including Nigeria. And I do think Adichie does a good job, particularly with her aunt, kind of talking about the sugar daddy phenomenon, that um, you, know, you, you become involved with someone not out of love, but for, for economic reasons. Um, you know, the, the main characters, I think, have a somewhat unique relationship. But then when they travel as immigrants, um, at least initially, even though, well, definitely Obinze struggles in the UK, and he's never able to find a fulfilling position, and this is a way to, to, to gain uh, 
you know, status in the UK, but also Ephemelu, um early on, because she's struggling with, with uh, lack of resources, you know, has to engage with the, the, the gym teacher guy. Um, and so this is, um, you have African immigrants are the most highly educated immigrant group in the United States. Uh, in general, not always, um, but so, you know, many African immigrants come here, they're used to having been in professional positions and then they get here for a variety of reasons, can't work in that same capacity, so they're, they're, they're forced to work in more menial jobs and then they're, they're dealing with economic security where these types of decisions have to be made. Any comment on the background? Well, please, I know you'll have many more interesting conversations in your group. Um, let me thank Professors Mosley and Brown for their